Garrett, welcome to mm. our show. Thank you. And it's uh, it's really cool to have you here. So, who is Mr. Garrett Gilkey? <laughs> so, who is he? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> oh man, um, it's an it's an ever unfolding com- <laughs> question, right? Um, geez, an know. enigma wrapped in a mystery. Yeah. Um, an enigma wrapped in a mystery. Um, you know, if you were to ask me, you know, probably six or seven years ago, I would have quoted Philippians where Paul talks about, um, where he says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more is I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And, um, and, but that was like, holy cow, right? Like the lifestyle I was living, like what I was doing, where I was at, so radically different than today, you know? And so, you know, Paul's posture in that is that, you know, his, he's taking a stance that like all of the other stuff aside, like his identity is rooted in Christ. And that, um, that's something for me that's been like, I've, you know, I've had radical transformation this last year. Right. And so even like at that season of life, probably five or six years ago, um, you know, like I couldn't even like, I, I can't even identify with that, you know? And, and so it's, it's, I'm a new creation, right? I mean, I guess that's like the, the easiest <laughs> way to put it. Um, I'm in recovery. Um, and I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, I mean, it's a, yeah, I, I, some days I know, some days I don't know, you know, some, some moments throughout the day, I know some moments throughout the day I'm like, I'm, I feel lost and I don't know where the hell I'm at. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a hard question. It is a hard question. That's a hard question. I, I think most people don't think it is, but it's a very, if you, I guess if you're um, whatever, superficial or just not really treating it like a question and just, you know, giving the basic answer, it's not that hard of a question, right? But when you really sit down and think about it, who yeah. are you? It's it's a very, very... Oh. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I live in polar, polar, polar extremes of worlds. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I am, um, run a construction company, design build firm here in Tampa, played in the NFL for four years. Um, you know, grew up with three sisters and, uh, two parents on a, you know, in a rural area outside Chicago, went to school in Northwest Nebraska, um, got drafted, played in the NFL, you know, um, had a crazy injury, you know, immediately got a master, master's degree, started another master's degree. Um, firm is doing great. I live in recovery. I'm around people who are living in recovery. I'm also around people that are the wealthiest people in the world, you know? So it's like, and I'm able to kind of like play in all of those worlds, you know? And so it's, it definitely creates a posture of like confusion when it comes Mm -hmm. to identity, right? Because it, you know, depending on where I'm at, like it's been really easy to get sucked up into like, yeah, I'm an affluent white business person. Right. And then, but I know that my identity is not there. I mean, like this, the depth of relationships are mm-hmm. just not present there. Right. And I, and it's one of the reasons I've loved TI so much is because of the, the posture and recovery that allows guys to be known and fully known and, and the ability to be like accepted there. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, you know, and so it's like, I'm sensing more of my identity around like the meek and lonely of heart. Right. And, yeah, I'm trying to figure that out because blessed every day, are those that right. It's like Jesus yeah. makes that point to go off that whole you know that whole tangent on the blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed are the meek. Yeah. Blessed, you know, it's so why why does Jesus spend all those you know verses uh, making a point to be like you're blessed when you're on this side of the coin, not the other yeah. side of the coin. You know, um, it's a life lesson that you know, a lot of people don't learn. Yeah. And I'm, and so I'm learning it. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm learning it and, um, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, like I, when you think about the, the paradigms, the paradoxes of Christ, the diverse excellencies of Christ, he's a lion like lamb. He's the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Um, you know, it's just, it's so, it's just like the contrast, like seeing the contrasts are just like so interesting. Um, you know, but it's, I know for me, like, I am, 
I'm, you know, like it's it's easy to kind of pull the narrative of the scripture and be like, yeah, I'm a child of God, right? Like, like, yeah, 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 I'm a child. Of God. But like, what the hell does that mean? Right, right. <laughs> I, I, I am firmly in this mindset that, like, in the 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 last quarter of my life here that I'm walking into, I am determined to try to put authentic language to some of the trite Christian sayings that have been used for so long. It's, it's yeah. I feel like, you know. There's so much more there when we really get into the whole new creation of all the stuff that Paul says, but just the way that we've put it on bumper stickers and signs in, inside of a church. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's like, well, no, you actually can't do all things. So what does he mean? Right. Yeah. I can't go be president of the United States. I can't yeah. go to a space. Um, there's things I just can't do. So what does it mean? And we can't just keep saying it means all things. Mm -hmm. It's like, so what is the language that brings us to, which in my opinion is our journey in life is to find our authentic self. It's, I get it. Our identities in Christ, everybody don't lose your crap. It's like, yeah, I got all that. But what does that even mean? It's like, okay, I want to walk in my authentic, true self. Yes, the one that, that Christ, you know, has given a new life to, the one that he named before the foundations of the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what does that actually look like in the day to day? Who is, who, who am I um, aside from all of the stuff I've either done right or I've done wrong, but aside from all of that, who am I? And and I th I don't think a lot of people really. It's a it can be an earth shattering question to sit there and mm -hmm. pontificate, right? It's like it can mess your world up if mm -hmm. you really spend time trying to figure out who you actually are. And I think it's because we we wait until you know we're on a podcast and somebody says <laughs> who are who is yeah Garrett Gilkey. Yeah, you know, and so, I mean, it's in, but that's a, the question is, a, is the journey, right? It's like, yeah. that's, that's the beautiful part of that question. It's like, it, it opens your eyes to the fact, like, I'm on the, my journey to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, it's, um, it's beautiful, right? Because, like, I get to, like, walk that out and figure that out, right? And so, part of, big piece for me in that lately has been this, like, posture of walking and surrender. And, acknowledging the things that I've always not wanted to acknowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's been the, the hand in hand step for me of like living in and staying in recovery. Um, you know, I'm like dealing with parts of who I am that for a long time I've not acknowledged. Right. You know, and so, um, you know, growing up with all, all sisters and then playing in the NFL, um, that's a stark contrast. Like you mm -hmm. don't, you, you don't like grow up in a environment with three sisters and, you know, being always being the NFL offensive lineman, like that's <laughs> like that philosophy, that mentality yeah. doesn't just come naturally out of that environment. Yeah. Right. So, right. um, so for most of my formative years, like I was an emotional, you know, um, introverted kid, you know, who like didn't want to walk in conflict. And, um, then I went to college and I had to like learn that. Like that was like something I had to learn. So I was able to learn it well. Mm -hmm. um, but all that really did is just mask the massive part of who I am. Right. And then you walk out this season of life or like that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then you're out of that season of life. And then you've got to like deal with like normal people again and like yourself. Right. And so it's been this process of like rediscovery for me too of like my emotions. Mm -hmm. Right. Because like when you're when you go to school in Northwest Nebraska at a tiny school and it's blue collar and it's a ranching college and then you play, you know, you play football at that level, like you are taught, like you are brain taught, you are brainwashed to not acknowledge self, mm -hmm. you know, and not acknowledge emotions, right? Because like emotions, feelings, pain, all of those things are things that you have to completely compartmentalize and, and not see, not live in, not listen to, I think more than anything. Mm-hmm because you've got a job and you're only as good as your last performance and you're only as good as your current performance. So therefore all other perspectives, emotions, feelings, ancillary things that are in competition of, you know, that are competing for where you're at have to be abandoned. Mm 
Right. You know, and so, um, so yeah, it's like, for me, it's like now that I'm on the other side of this, this season of life or in this journey, I'm like rediscovering the value and the beauty and like listening to myself and listening to my emotions and really just like seeing where God's directing my heart. Right. And so, um, that's been like a really cool process, right. Is like, is for most, you know, for the last 31 years of my life, I've been so entrepreneurial, so visionary. So like my mind is, you know, a thousand yards down the road and like, that's what I'm chasing after. Well, how many mountaintop experiences can you, can you walk into and, and crush, right. And, and accomplish and achieve to only like get to a place where you realize like how many more mountains are there for me to climb? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and so then you, then you have to ask yourself like, Oh, like, so for me, like that was the journey, right? And like sought after playing in the NFL from being in second, third grade, massive down the road goal, accomplish that. Then I saw a vision of having a successful organization, you know, a couple years down the road, bam, crush that, you know, and then it, then, and so like this last year, I've been in the season of like, well, what's next? Right. Well, when there's not something that's next, then you have to deal with yourself. Yeah. You have to deal yeah. with being present. You have to deal with the present circumstances. And, um, and that was something for me that I've never really had to do because of the circumstantial kind of like place in life that I was, that I was in either in, in both vocations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's been this crazy journey of like, you know, taking a biblical perspective towards my current circumstances and then making radical decisions to change my circumstances based on scriptural truth, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's been a, yeah, crazy journey. Yeah. Well, and I got a newsflash because I'm quite a bit older than you. It's just beginning. Yeah. So yeah. it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I love being around you cause you'll say things like, you know, where you're at and I'm like, he has no idea. <laughs> he's, he's yet to learn <laughs> young buck. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, but no, going off of like what you're saying, it's, um, that's why I think you're attracted to the Timothy Initiative men. That's why being around people like that, because when you lose everything mm. by total destruction that you maybe caused yourself or, or whatever, there is no more falsehoods. There is no more whatever. So it's like you either see where you're at, which is totally at the bottom and God wants to do something amazing in your life. Will you let him do that? Mm-hmm. And then you see these guys begin to, to, to cling to that. And that's when they're, they just do these amazing things. But the guys that will come in and still somehow try to cling to that NFL experience or that whatever other experience that's gone, man, it's over. It's yeah. like you broke your leg playing in the NFL. It would be like if, the, for a couple of years, you were still like thinking you were going to go back oh, where yeah. it's like, dude, it's over. Let yeah. it go. And so being around at least the Timothy initiative guys, because our guys are the ones that are like come in right on the bottom. Those dreams have been washed away. Mm-hmm. So we can either look at where we are and do we want to make the most of where our life is at and what we have yet to accomplish or not. Mm-hmm. And I think authenticity comes from from those situations. Right. And I think it's almost in a way, you know, not just you, but others that, you know, before you that have really enjoyed being around the men. And it's always the same thing where it's almost like these guys that have nothing have something that the person who does have everything wants. So a hundred percent, you know, I remember, um, when I, you know, and I was at a pretty dark place in life, you know, when I went from being with the Cleveland Browns to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, you know, and growing up in the church and having very much so a deep, always, you know, growing up with a, with a, edu- a deep education in the Bible and in Christianity. So developing a, you know, developing over time, a really, really good he- head knowledge of scripture and of things in Christianity. Um, you know, I had heard, you know, in, in two of the gospels, Jesus says, what is it to gain the entire world and forfeit mm-hmm. your soul? Yeah. You know, and, and that, um, you know, was a, was a, out of Mark, uh, a text and a, and a piece of scripture that my mom sent to me in transition to Tampa. And, um, and it, you know, I'd heard that verse hundreds of times growing up. Right. And it, and it didn't hold true and I didn't understand it and didn't, I didn't have like relatability to it for the first time until, until she sent that to me. 
Um, and it just is, it's, I mean, it's goodness gracious. You know I mean? I think that's one of the things that I've been wrestling with the most lately is just like as someone who's like living in and walking in complete surrender and in recovery, mm -hmm. just how the subtle nuances of like our own strength and our own pride, like totally, totally take us away from seeing honestly, like the things that God's really calling us to. Yeah. Yeah. You who know, he's calling us to and who he's calling us to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, um, so it's, we've known each other a few years now. We, we met well before the pandemic hit. So it's so weird that it doesn't feel like that much time, but so that's been a few years and we've currently, we've become really good friends and spend a lot of time around each other. But in the people may not, may or may not believe this, but I've never even asked you a single question about being in the <laughs> NFL. <laughs> I've never even brought it up. Yeah. It's so it's like, it's kind of funny. I'm like on this podcast, I'm like, I don't ever talk to Garrett about being in the NFL. <laughs> we talk about so many other things, but you did, I did overhear you tell a story and I thought it was pretty um, powerful and important <clears throat> that you had made it to the NFL and then you, you know, were on, I think you said a night game on TV and broke your leg, mm -hmm. but you felt in that moment, you were like, you trusted the will of God. Yeah. So, you know, this is for probably another conversation, but, um, you know, I tell people that I got, I got saved last year and, and people who have known me, um, like can't understand that. Um, you know, but I think, you know, like, so if you read, you know, Ephesians and Colossians and you read like the teachings of Paul and like what the, what the lifestyle looks like after kind of being saved or being, being a new creation. Like that's what happened to me last year. I got filled with Holy Spirit, which had never really happened before. And I always knew that I was always drawn by the spirit, um, and grew up in Christianity around it. But, um, you know, it wasn't something that became like real, like in total surrender, right. Or like, you know, other like theological terms like lordship salvation, right. Until like last year. And, um, and so, you know, and I had written for desiring God and John Piper and, you know, and, and done a lot of vocational ministry beforehand, which again, like just totally crushes every paradigm of perspective. Um, <clears throat> you know, in that moment, yeah, we were playing against the Miami dolphins and, um, and I was playing left guard and, uh, I was, blocking this dude that was like 380 pounds and it, was, <laughs> and it was a pass play which means that instead of the offensive line attacking going forward at the defensive line we're basically um <clears throat> we're basically like you know stepping in a in a defensive posture back not not attacking and so <clears throat> so this guy that was like 380 pounds was just running down my throat trying to kill our quarterback who's uh, your quarterback um gosh who was it then i think it was it was Jameis. Jameis winston no no it wasn't james i don't remember who it was no, it was one of the backup guys. It's a, um, you know, it's just a little trivia. It's like who you broke your leg in your final play. Who yeah, was the quarterback? Yeah, yeah I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. Um, but my left tackle got beat inside, and so as I'm shutting down this bull rush, and it's basically that's that's a bull rush is is when a defensive lineman is just literally just trying to mm -hmm. just just steamroll you. Um, my the 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 guys playing next to got beat. And his guy did a spin move and did a spin move to go inside on on him, and he fell. And as he fell, he basically per just propelled, just like shot into the side of my knee. Mm, my lord! And so my knee just my leg just cracked in half. So my I tore my ACL, I tore my MCL, uh, my patella. I I, this is so, so crazy. I felt my patella literally just like go to the back of my leg, and then go back. It was the most excruciating pain I've ever been in. Um, I actually had that happen. Did you? Yeah, I was play I played college football and uh, and I and playing at Syracuse and I got hit on a I was a running back and got hit on the side of my knee and my leg completely bent into the inside of my knee touched the turf. Oh. It was anyway. I've had like multiple knee surgeries. Dude. Anyway, story for another time. But go on. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm laying on the ground and um, in excruciating pain, and that that was the really the first time I, I really like felt the peace of God and I felt peace in a time where otherwise you would have just ridiculous hor like in horrible circumstances. Right? right. So like, so scripture talks about how, um, you know, he is, you know, the peace beyond all understanding. And so in that moment, like I was experiencing peace beyond all understanding. And it was really this like posture of surrender. I was like, honestly, I was like done playing. Like I was so sick and tired of the lifestyle. I was sick and tired of just the, the crap of having to deal with the, just a ridiculously, you know, transactional organization at that degree. 
um, yeah. all of the crap that goes along with playing at that level. Um, and so I, I felt peace because I knew that like one, I was going to be okay. Right. I mean, so like, you know, you get injured in the NFL, you're, you're getting paid. You know? <laughs> so like, so like there was a, there was some freedom, you know, there, there was some, some peace in that, but like, that wasn't it. It was more so just, it was, it was surrender. It was like, okay, yeah, I'm done holding on to this, you know? And, and so, yeah, I mean, I felt the presence of God in that moment. And, and what year was that? Uh, 2000, I think in 16, 16. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. Two, I think it was that season. And, um, but I felt the presence of God, you know, and I, I just felt complete peace and like, and, and so you, you can't, I mean, it was just, it was just so radical. Right. I mean, like you, you know, are living in at that environment, like you're in a constant state of anxiety, you're in a constant state of stress. Right. I mean, and, and then performing at that level, it's like peace isn't something that right, as right. an offensive lineman or any player in the NFL, like <laughs> you have, right. And right. So especially not after a, an, a career ending injury. Right. So like, um, but that's what I had. That's what I experienced. And so that was, you know, so I wrote this article that, you know, b- buddy of mine and a buddy of mine and I wrote this article, um, you know, that night on it. And uh, it was published by Desiring God. And um, and so but that's what's so crazy. Right. I mean, like that, you know, like just was like setting the tone really for like the start of my journey of surrender. Right. You know, and so it. Um, but yeah, crazy, crazy injury. Um, yeah. and also just like an awesome experience of, of God in in a circumstance that otherwise, you know, most people wouldn't. I wonder how much of it was, um, you, we, sometimes as human beings, we find ourselves in situations that we like consciously don't have the, the courage or the wherewithal to just end it. It's like staying in a relationship too mm. long. And, and like, I'll see guys, you know, be in a relationship with a girl too long and, and, and they just keep doing worse and worse things. Like, <laughs> I, I'm like, you're just hoping she breaks up with you eventually is what yeah. you're doing. And because yeah. you don't have the, you know what, to just yeah. end it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder like how much of it was like, you just were done with that lifestyle. And like, all of a sudden it's like, whoo, I'm out. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so much of it too. I mean, like, here's the challenge. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago about, um, like, I was never set up for success in, in my career. I mean, it just was like, you're either a first or second round draft pick or, or you're the guy that just walks in the door, has a starting position, is able to have a consistent position, a consistent spot. But when you're, when you're thrown in and you're thrown in at left guard one day, right guard one day, center one day, you know, you're starting at right guard one day, you know, and backing up at left guard the other day and starting at left guard the other, I mean, it's just like, you can't, there's no consistency. Yeah. And so for, for someone like me, right. I mean, like I've got, all sorts of crazy childhood trauma and crap that I've gone through, like in wrestling with ADD, like I need consistency. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, consistency is, is, is like, I thrive in consistency. That's one of the things that I struggle with as a organizational leader now is that I'm in charge. You know, that's yeah. one of the reasons I've walked in crisis the last, you know, the last couple of years is because no one's telling me, Garrett, this is what you have to do at eight o'clock, eight thirty, eight forty five. you know, nine o'clock, you know, but my entire, you know, the last 15 years of my life has just been this ridiculous structure You know, and so, um, yeah, it's just been this, it's been this wild journey. Right. And, uh, um, but I was, I was ready to, I think I was was just ready to be done, you know, and and most guys, most guys, because it's such an idol, Mm -hmm. like it's such an idol, like it's one of the biggest idols in our culture. I mean, you've got guys that, I mean, one of the, like, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, when you're in recovery, you can, you can see someone who's not, you know, that's still struggling in addiction. Sure. It's just so black and white, Mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, I I see the idolatry in it when I see the multitudes of guys wearing other men's jerseys, right? And like Mm -hmm. their entire lifestyle, their life, their perspective, their entire, like the way in which they see all relationships and circumstances is through the lens of a Browns jersey, right? Or the screen. I mean, it's just mind blowing to me that like, that is how you interpret reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so being an emotional creature, right, and um, not and and feeling the weight of sin, right, and like the sexual crap in that environment, the materialism in that environment, the pride and the ego in that environment. I mean, it's like a unless like God has specifically wired you to transcend those circumstances, and there are mm-hmm. guys that that um, that have been called to that. I mean, I don't I don't wish that on my children. Yeah, you know, I definitely don't. So when it happened. Um, you know, I was just, I was ready to give it up. And, and, and in a, in a beautiful way, I mean, that's one of the things that I definitely struggle with is like, I don't quit. 
And it doesn't matter. I mean, that's definitely hurt me at times in my life, but, um, and it's also blessed me at times in my life, you know, but it, it was something where even going into that year, I think it was my third year. I just didn't, um, I just had no desire, Yeah, you know, I just had absolutely no desire to, um, you know, to just like stay in that environment. And the hardship is, is because it's such an idol to so many guys, especially guys that are in that environment, they're slaves to the materialism. They're slaves to the sex. They're slaves to the money. You know, they're slaves to the pride of it, right? I mean, so like when you're a slave to sin, like, Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this at Bible study. This was brought up in Bible study. In James, it says, you know, desires give birth to sin. Sin over time gives birth to death. You know, and so like when you're afforded the, the, like the fleshly ability to like continue to feed your addictions. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, that's really all it is at that level just further addictions. Um, you know, you just, yeah. Even when it's, even when it's toxic for you, right? Like guys just still stay in it. That's, that's actually the root of addiction. It's (laughs) like, like, that's the very definition of addiction. It's like, even (laughs) though it's killing you, you won't stop. You won't stop. (laughs) Right. You know, and so, so it was, it was an addiction that, that God started to chip away pretty quickly, you know? And so when it, so when the, when the circumstance happened that was outside my control, that forced me into a posture of surrender, what did I experience? Peace. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. That's yeah. a beautiful thing. It's, it's, here's the thing I think that as actually, you know, is okay. So we are in the middle, you know, the world is in the middle of a mental health crisis, addiction crisis, suicide is through the roof. Um, you know, the whole world is finally aware of people struggling. Um, and, uh, you know, various reasoning behind why people are struggling. Oh, it's because they had to wear masks. Oh, it's their fear of the coronavirus. Oh, it, you know, there's a lot of different definitions of why people are struggling. But I personally feel like what we're seeing is a lot of people lose an identity that they clung to as an idol as opposed to being authentically who they were. And so when they lose that job, everything falls apart. When they lose that relationship, everything falls apart. When they can't afford that boat, everything falls apart. When they can't afford, it's like, so it's, once again, it's it's not that all of a sudden the whole world doesn't have enough serotonin coming hmm. into the brain. Hmm. It's not that all of a sudden dopamine receptors have ceased to work on mass pe- masses mm-hmm. of people. That's not what's happened. What's happened is people have taken their very uh, substance of them has been taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, what makes trauma so traumatic is when you don't have an end in sight. And so Mm -hmm. people like not knowing like, when is this, is it ever going to end has, has amplified that. And so it's interesting, you know, I definitely wasn't headed here, but that's just how this goes. But you talking about what happened to you in the NFL and, and you being having that peace that transcended all understanding, most people don't. And so when that thing is taken from them and they don't know, there's the, I, I'm just going to say this, the greatest fear I, I have, have ever had in my life is to not know who the hell I am. Yeah. And so it's like when the thing, you don't mm-hmm. realize that the thing is the thing. But when it's taken from you and you're like, well, who am I? It's it's like, you know, when people, you know, they're a husband or a wife comes home and leaves the other one and, and the person didn't see it coming. And it's like my world collapses. It's usually not because they were so in love with the other person. It's just because now who the hell am I? Yeah. It's, it's the stripping away of everything, which is why, coincidentally, when we think back to what you said about Paul in the beginning, that's why he's saying it was all trash yeah. besides knowing Christ. And that's the, to me, that's what's beautiful about being a part of the guys at TI and seeing, seeing Paul's teachings in Ephesians and Colossians, right? And, and really studying like his, like the teachings on being a new creation and Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of heaven and Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus about being born again of, Mm -hmm. of, you know, and, and really understanding, like asking ourselves the question, like, like, does my lifestyle line up with that of those teachings? Like, does it, does it? You know, I know for me, it didn't for 31 years until, until last year, you know, when God spiritually woke me up, you know, because I was basically, I had walked to the every single issue of, you know, major sin issue in my life, you know? And so like, you know, throughout the last 15 years, I mean, he's slowly been chipping away at at the different, you know, major sin areas in my life. And it wasn't until last year that like, bam, you got punched in the back of the head with the last one. And like, that's what's so interesting, right? It's like, that's what's so interesting about 
for me, like trauma, you know, I was having a conversation with my roommate a few months ago and, um, he was a, he's a Navy SEAL getting ready to come out. And we were talking about the abruptness of death. And I had just with another one of my roommates seen, um, a guy in Hyde park here in Tampa on a motorcycle, basically die in front of me, Mm -hmm. you know, crashed into the side of a car. And, um, that was extremely, extremely traumatic for me, right? Cause I was getting ready to go, you know, I was meeting two of my friends at, at, you know, Iris 31 and we're getting ready to just like, you know, we're just hanging out and all of a sudden smack. And I knew exactly what it was, turned around, was right there. I had a Harley Davidson sh- shirt on, ripped it off, put it underneath his head. He died right in front of me. And it was horribly, horribly traumatic. Yeah. You know, so, so. <clears throat> a couple of days later, having a conversation with him, my other roommate, and um, he's a Navy SEAL and just like talking about like how so many of those guys at that level and they're all elite performers, right? And so like that's, there's another, it's another conversation for later, but um, the correlations between Navy SEALs and NFL players is so similar. Mm-hmm. And so um, we had a conversation just about like, how do you, you know, how do you like manage, how do you manage that, right? Knowing like what you have to do and how do you maintain sobriety with having to, to, you know, walk into some of the circumstances that you guys have to walk into and just preparedness, you know I mean? It was, it was knowing accurately understanding what's going to happen and being able to be prepared for it. And so to me, that's, what's been so crazy about like experiencing, like experiencing God in the traumatic things that are un- unseen is that when, when something traumatic happens that I didn't expect, that's why it's so traumatic. I didn't expect it. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and then, uh, um, shock value. Yeah. The shock value of it. Right. And so like, that's been so interesting for me to like, to spend some time thinking about. It's, it's funny because, um, I always give this lesson to new leaders when, you know, uh, in the Timothy initiative, you know, almost all the men have had very, very traumatic lives and done some pretty traumatic things. And so I always say, give this a piece of advice when you're doing a one-on-one with a new guy, just remember to maintain your composure, no matter what he says, Mm -hmm. I don't care if his head falls off and a chicken flies out, you do not break the way you're sitting, the way you're looking at him because people will say the most outlandish, outrageous sin they've ever done to see if you will reject them yeah to see that look in your eye like oh my god he's one of those yeah. and 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 then from that moment you'll you'll uh, you'll you may never have a chance to really connect with that individual yeah. and and it's a subconscious thing people don't walk into it and be like i'm going to see if garrett can reject me but it's it just accident it just comes out and that's why like the very first meeting with people usually for me in in the in the work that I do as a counselor they'll say the craziest stuff stuff they probably wouldn't say six meetings down the road but yeah. that first meeting I want to see if you're just going to not want anything to do with me and it's that total trauma shock value of it all their trauma trying to shock you to see if you'll reject them I str- I struggle with that you know, you've probably sensed that you probably, I, I'm sure you saw that and you've seen that in me, right? That's been one of my defense mechanisms to know whether or not I can be vulnerable sure. in community with the different people, right? I mean, cause I'm talking about identity, you know, if I'm with some of the wealthiest people in our community, right? It's like, I can't, I can't be that open, right? So it's mm-hmm. just like, so it's, it's been this interesting journey of like learning, you know, the depth of vulnerability that I can be with certain individuals while also realizing like I still am called to those individuals and I'm still called to being in some of those environments. Yeah. You know, but it's, it saddens me. Mm-hmm. Like it just, I mean, again, especially talking about like, you know, the principles and acts, right. And like really understanding the early church and the way that we were intended to live in community. And, and it just, you know, it's, it saddens me, right. That we can't be more transparent. We can't be more open because of the relatability and brokenness just at times isn't there in people. And so that's been something though, that it's been a defense mechanism that I probably should work through, but also something that's <laughs> been, a, it's been a huge blessing because, because it's given me the ability to relate more intimately to guys that are in, in recovery, mm-hmm. you know, which is in return, super life giving for me because of the opportunity to see hope and to walk alongside guys. Right. And, and so it's just, recovery is beautiful. It is. If you, if, if people are willing to, to take that step, it's funny. One of our, um, our, like we, we met a few years ago, hung out a few times, pandemic hit. We didn't see each other for years and then we got back together. But one of those early meetings when we were first getting, I don't know if you remember this, but we were sitting at the, 
in Armature Works at Buddy Brew, and you're telling me this story about what's going on in your life, and it was really personal, and you stop in the middle, and you're like, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Yeah. I guess it's because you have a bunch of tattoos, and you're an ex-drug addict that I can trust you. <laughs> I'm like, that's usually what I get from people. They're like, this yeah. guy's so jacked up. I can tell him anything. Yeah, I, mean, it, <laughs> it's like, I mean, I'm telling you, like, that's, but like, what does that say? <laughs> What does that say? Like, especially in like pastoral care or pastoral mm-hmm. ministry, right? Where, where the assumption is that we're taking a spiritual posture from God towards people, right? What does that say? The rhetor- like, and that's a rhetorical question, right? Yeah. But like that to me is like, that was the beginning. And I had, like, I had had already been walking out that kind of general kind of posture towards Christianity, right? The last, you know, even in years prior to that, but like, there is a depth of knowing Christ that comes from from walking out degrees of of suffering, mm-hmm. you know. And so for me, it's it's just sad that that that's rare, you know. And like I think that's one of the reasons I've, I've been we've been so drawn to each other, and that I've appreciated our relationship so much is because like there was immediately that freedom, right? And it's like yeah, we could objectify and laugh about it and talk about the tattoos and and whatnot, but the reality is is like like that. It's just like that's a gift. Like that's an unbelievable gift, and and it's sad to me that like we just don't get to see that more often. Yeah, and I I think it's it's <clears throat> like goes back to what we were just saying a few minutes ago about people not their identity be identity you know actually being an idol of some sort whatever that may be, and so subconsciously they they're you know I don't think people consciously go around saying I'm going to be you know shut off to this person and that person, but it's just a subconscious defense mechanism where they know they don't want to lose that stature, whatever it might be, and and saying too much yeah. might put that in jeopardy. And so we have guarded people having guarded conversations, and the worst place for it, and I hate to say it, is in the freaking church. Oh man! Which is why you know I think it, it's so interesting to me when I think about the correlation of all the different things that have transpired in the last few years, and you know from the mental health issues and from you know just the way that the world is waking up to people really struggling, but then also the mass exodus that the church has seen because the church has not been a safe place for people that are struggling. And now that people are being open about struggling, it's becoming more apparent. So when we're all like faking it in the side of this four walls and we can do a little mission thing on a weekend once a month, or we can do a little food drive every few weeks and whatever, fill in the blank, do you hit your checklist? It's, it makes it, you know, that's okay. But now that things are like coming to the surface, you know, people want to get out of those doors and not, not return. And it, and it's, what's it going to take for people to understand? It's like, you know, man, the scariest Bible verse I ever read was when Jesus says, you know, the people come up to him like, Lord, Lord, I have, I have, you know, done deliverance in your name. I've, you know, cast out demons in your name. I've healed in your name. What more, what more much must I do? And Jesus says those terrifying words of away from me for I did not know you. Mind blowing. Yeah. It's mind blowing. You know, I, you know, this is the, the mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing, and but I could relate to that because I didn't get saved until last year. Right, you can relate to it now. I could relate to it now. Right? Two years ago, you would have thought I was nuts. No, two years ago, I was like that. Yeah, that's just a. I mean, there's just something written in scripture. Right, right, right. Like, there's no relevance that you know. There's nothing to that. Um, but then I got saved last saved last year. Find found myself in an existing church community that I was hoping to find more life from because I'm now diving into authenticity in those communities only to not be received Mm -hmm. and not be in and to not be known and and to to just be further objectified and further used it's like what the hell like that that is not the spirit of God like if you look at Galatians the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness and in first Corinthians it talks about in the greatest of these is love like and if you're not seeing that and you're seeing transactionalism right or you're seeing just the objectifying nature in relationships or, or worse than that, for me, I was bringing others that I was discipling into that community for them to just be objectified and not seen it's yeah. like, as a, as a young believer, as really as a, as a new creation, as a young believer with this crazy head knowledge of scripture, um, I was looking at that and I was like, holy cow, like this is not a safe place. 
Mm-hmm. It's if anything, it's spiritual abuse. Like it's an extreme, it's an abusive place to be. Right. You know, and so that was, um, yeah, goodness gracious. You want to talk about the tables being flipped over. I mean, yeah. that was, uh, it was a crazy, crazy experience. And like, even that was challenging, right? Like you talk about like trauma, it's like you're spiritually woken up and then all of a sudden now you've got to walk away from, you got to walk away from church relationships. Like that's extremely traumatizing. It's very traumatizing. I know um, over the last few years, losing many relationships because of the way that the church and, you know, politics came together and, and I didn't really work for me. Um, and, you know, so seeing and, friends of years and and people just you know um whatever broken relation it's a it's traumatic thing because you know i believe we're spiritual creatures and that we're meant to be in spiritual relationships and we're meant to be in community with each other we're meant to be in life with each other god says early on in scripture it's not good for man to be alone and he doesn't mean just with a wife he means it's not good to be alone We're, we're we're we need to be amongst each other and so the question is like, okay, so we know that that is incredibly traumatic when we lose those relationships with church communities and spiritual leaders and things of that nature because of what we're created to have, and then we lose that. But but the question is, is false peace better? No, because it's an illusion. I mean, it's not real. Yeah. Like, it's it's not real. You know, and, and I think that's, that I think is the, it's the beauty, right? I mean, like scripture talks about, you know, beauty out of ashes, right? And so a lot of, a lot of the prophetic Old Testament narratives are, are about, you know, walls being torn down, the nation of Israel being torn down to be rebuilt, right? And so like that just repetitive nature is, is kind of communicated throughout scripture. And like, that's also a reflection of our lives, right? Like that's going to happen. And so, you know, when in, in, in the gospels, when, we have the testament of Jesus going into the temples and flipping the tables. Like growing up, that was taught for me as like, just like, Oh, this is about righteous anger. Like, no, like that's right, what right. happens when the spirit enters someone's body is everything gets flipped over mm-hmm. or you can't, yeah. you can't, you know, my girlfriend, Whitney and I talk about with each other, you know, and she's amazing, but we talk about just like, you, we can't unsee each other, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of our relationship is just like the way in which our relationship has grown from, just these like a vulnerable place and just seeing each other in kind of like the depths of who we are and then just right. kind of building on that. Um, but you know, so like that really, that, that just like being known kind of like mindset and being present mindset is, is what is so excruciatingly painful about walking out some of those tables being flipped experiences of, you know, that really take us away from the false peace, right? Mm-hmm. And like the false relationships. I mean, yeah. like those are not, those are not real relationships, right? So it's, it's the hope is, you know, from scripture is that in the walls being torn down, he's going to rebuild them. And he does, and he has, and we see that in recovery, sure. right? And, but it, it's a painful experience to like methodically see the walls torn down, right? And, but I would, I wouldn't have it any other way because otherwise you're just, I mean, in Isaiah, right? I mean, like he knew us before he laid the, you know, he he knew before he laid the foundations of the earth. Right. I mean, so if we're called to be known, right. And so like being spiritually woken up also gives us the assumption and gives us the knowledge and and the, really the heart posture that like we are known by the God of the universe Mm -hmm. and he really has called us by name and he has called us into fellowship with him. He has called us into relationship. Well then like, if that is the picture of us towards our creator, that should be also the way in which we respond horizontally to those around us. Right. And so when that isn't the case, it's just not real. Which is why I think it's, uh, you know, when you see Christianity blowing up in other parts of the world, it's in places where, um, you know, the different governmental systems, usually, it's usually not in capitalist societies. It's yeah. just not. I'm not yeah. saying down yeah. with capitalism. I'm just saying it's usually in like tyrannical like mm-hmm. governments where people are basically put onto a level playing field um, by the government or whatever, or they're just poverty, third world. And yeah. there isn't all these other things to cling to. And so we see Christianity like blowing up in a good way where brothers and sisters coming together and, you know, doing life together and the church is exploding and people are coming to faith and people are being healed. The dead are being raised, but 
not in like a country, you know, like ours where there's just too much at stake, brother. There's too much at stake for people to be open and honest with what's broken inside them. I I mean, if, if Christ came to set the captives free, right, why do we live with a mindset that, oh, yeah, once saved, that was it? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, no, Christ, like, he saves me every single day. Absolutely. Every single day, his grace is what covers me. Every single day, as I walk in surrender, which is the only way I'm able to stay in the posture th- that Jesus speaks to as, as relating to the kingdom of heaven. Right. I have to trust that when I go to the cross in, in my relationships, in my posture of leadership in my organization, right, or with the shit from my past and my trauma that there is a blessing on the other side of that thing that I don't want to walk into. Right. Like, no, we just, we think that it's just, um, it's a, it's a cultural and a social association. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's something I do every first Tuesday of every month. Right. It's, (laughs) it's, it's something like I do Thursday mornings. Right. Right. It's like, that's a lie. Like that's a complete lie. Tim Keller talks about, um, you know, he talks about pluralistic societies and talks about the engaged um, culture and Christianity and the unengaged kind of subculture. And like what I've seen around me this last year in, in regards to like what I've walked away from is, is a subculture of just lifestyle individuals sure. claiming yeah. knowledge of God, as opposed to when you see in Daniel and what you see throughout a lot, a lot of the, you know, the old Testament narrative and what you see of, in Paul's teachings in Romans, right. Is like the lifestyle of engagement in a pluralistic society. Like we're living, you know, in this, you know, the, the era of Babylon, right. The, mm-hmm. In the Roman empire, like we're living in that today. But the problem is like Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, be transformed by the ruining of your mind. Like how many people are, are walking that out? Right. Well, they're not. You know what I was, I was thinking of? I was looking at today. I was looking at John 3.16, but not the John 3.16 that everybody knows. So there's John 3.16 that's on every football stadium and whatever, but there's 1 John 3.16, which is actually pretty powerful in and of itself. 1 John 3.16 is, you know, Jesus showed us what love was by laying down his life. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters as well. And then goes on in, you know, uh, 317 to say, if you have possessions and you see a brother or sister with none and you have no pity, then the love of God is not in you. It's like, that's the three John, the 316 that John, we should be listening to. It's like yeah. laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That means, okay, listen, I get it. Everybody immediately thinks death. But it also can mean I'm willing to to put myself out there for you because it's gonna help you, but it may embarrass me. Yeah. It may it may embarrass me and you may judge me, but it, it could help you help you. Like a, a the person that comes to the businessman who's struggling and the bit meanwhile the businessman knows he's got a problem with prostitutes and pornography himself, but instead of laying down his life and saying, you know what, man, I struggle too. Why don't we go to a a sex addiction meeting together? He hides it and says, you know, well, you need to go get some help. It's the laying down of your life is the laying down of your position in this world. Or, I mean, yeah, I guess it could be life too in the Ukraine and things like that. But here right now, for the sake of argument, he's talking about laying down that position of, of your title in this world in order to, to help that brother or sister who's in need. Mm-hmm. But it may put you out there. I, I mean, if we don't read like and understand Paul's teachings on being co-heirs with Christ and co-creators, right? We're going to live in this like mere vision, you know, version of Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's all about just like the stuff that, that I kind of routinely do. Well, like the spirit is ever moving, right? And so like Paul says to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So like, that's the, like, that's the, the posture we are to take towards our circumstances. I was in a Bible study last week where I mother effed a guy, and, which <laughs> was my pride issue. And it was not him. It was my issue. But I got up and left because just the way in which the conversation was unfolding was so unindictive of the spirit of God. And so then in my mind, again, I probably pulled the trigger too quickly. You will Smith them. I will Smith them. And, um, <laughs> but I mean, it was like, 
I'm not speaking like we're not engaging in a perspective that's rooted in the spirit. And, and there's no desire to acknowledge that. Like, and that was really it. It was like, it wasn't about capitalism. It, was, it wasn't about him. I mean, it was one, it was the challenge was my own sin. Right. But, but that's the wrestling. The wrestling is that we all take the assumption because of the head knowledge that comes from living in this culture, that we're all living in a, this, a similar posture mm-hmm. of the spirit. And like, you know, that's not safe. I mean, that's just, that's just for someone who's in recovery, right? right. It's like, I'm trying to follow Jesus like every day, like legitimately, like lay down my life for my brother, knowing that that's where life comes from. Right. And like, that's what we see again throughout most of the narrative of scripture is like, that's the heart posture we are to have. Right. Um, what the hell am I doing in those <laughs> environments? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, but I mean, it just is, uh, it's uh, it's sobering. It's super, 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 super sobering. Yeah, it can be. Um, it, it can be a lot of things. Um, so let's kind of think of this as our last question. How do we, how do we make sure we continue to do this? That we continue to walk out, um, with our minds renewed. You know, being willing to lay down our lives. How do we know we're not clinging to? making an, our identity into an idol. How do we walk that line, in your opinion, um, or how do we try to, um, to the best of our ability, to not fall back into those old ways? Because we're a fool if we don't think we can, because we can. It's sort of like you do. We didn't really talk about it today, but you do have a very um, successful construction company who I am uh, currently a business partner with. So I have to hats off to that. But... um but what if it was taken from you tomorrow? Mm-hmm. So, so when it comes to, when it comes down to it, you broke your leg and the NFL was taken from you. Mm-hmm. But the IRS steps in tomorrow and takes your company from you. Are you still transcending peace? So, how yeah. do we make sure we're still in that position? And I know you like to say, uh, you know, surrender, walk and surrender. Mm-hmm. But what is what does that mean to maybe a guy listening or watching or a girl watching or listening? You know, from a leadership standpoint, and we're all in postures of leadership, right? I mean, you know, in Psalms it says to stop, to cease striving, right? Or, or in other translations, it, it says to be still. I really love the ESV where it says to cease striving and know that I am God. And and I think we got to ask ourselves that rhetorical question: like, am I at a posture of peace? Because if if being in the kingdom of heaven, right? If one of the characteristics of being in the kingdom of heaven is a posture of peace in my, in that particular circumstance, in that particular relationship, in this particular thing, right? Whatever, whatever it is that our eyes are focused on, like, am I in a posture of peace? And if I'm not, I've got to ask myself the questions why. Right. And then really, am I called to chase after that at that degree, right? Or am I called to chase after that at all? Because if I'm not called to chase after that, um, what does that lead to? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Leads to not good things, right? Or if that is what I'm called to, but I'm trying to make it happen faster than it's happening, <clears throat> I'm trying to go ahead of God. Mm-hmm. And the moment you go ahead of God, you're taking yourself out of a, a protected a posture, right? And so, you know, so I, I kind of start with like that mindset, right? Like, are you at peace in that circumstance? And if you're not, then we need to slow down and ask ourselves why. Yeah, I think I, I do like that where it's... um Let's try not to wait until I break your, I, might, I break my leg or, or the IRS steps in. Let's try to be prepared before that day even comes. Am I at peace? And you that in and, and that comes with like so for example like for me in business right and over the course of this last year like the whole organization I mean goodness gracious I mean you know we went from thirty employees to you know almost doubling that with TI right mm-hmm. and so. Um, that's scary as heck, yeah. right? Like now I've got, I'm 31 and I've got the weight of like all of these people on my shoulders, right? And like their spiritual condition too. Like that's a serious thing. It's one thing to just live in transactional relationship with people that are part of an organization because mm-hmm. it's transactional. Well, that's not my firm at all. And you know, like that's, that doesn't, right. that's not any single relationship in my firm. And, and so when that's the case, you recognize that like God's calling me to steward this, right? And so I think that's really the mm-hmm. the first, it's very kind of garden theology. It's like God has either given us something or he's not, right? I mean, so Adam was placed in the garden, given the vocation that God gave him, and then to name the animals that God brought to Adam, right? And so Adam was able to exercise dominion over all creation that was he was first placed into and that was brought to him. Right. And so I think when we live in that mindset, like, what does that do? That takes you from like trying to control the circumstances to 
this posture of acknowledgement that like I am a temporary steward. Like mm-hmm. that's the shepherding, right? Like I am, you know, I am shepherding. I'm a temporary steward of what's been placed in my in my hands. So when I recognize that that in my life, if I'm trying to like a, obtain something or get something that hasn't been given to me or brought to me, I got to ask myself why, mm-hmm. you know? And so when I live with that mindset towards the relationships around me, right. And I, I found myself striving and trying to like create relationships mm-hmm. and like yeah. hold on to relationships that were like only one way relationships or codependent relationships. And those mm-hmm. are not relationships from the Lord. Right. And <clears throat> right. Or vocational things, right? Like, okay. So in business it was, Wow. Okay. With that mindset now and understanding that like garden theology there, it's like, God, you've given me this for me to steward and temporary shepherd, you know, temporarily shepherd. That means that, okay, now I'm going to operate in these different principles of surrender or these different biblical principles, knowing that I can't control whether or not the economy changes tomorrow, we go to war, right? Or inflation or supply chain, you know, issues like affect the organization or half my team quits. But I can control what I do today Mm -hmm. and how I manage today and how I steward and shepherd today. And ultimately, like, that's what God's calling me to do. You know, and it's it's a liberating place. And so when you've been to the bottom, right, and and life has brought you to that place, then it's then you can look at something that grosses X, right, in business opportunity, whatever it is, and go like, what is it to gain the entire world and forfeit your soul? Right. You know, or in Ecclesiastes, you know, it's, you know, it talks about all things under the sun, right? The vanity behind things under the sun. It's like when you recognize that really all things are spiritual, Paul says that again, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities mm-hmm. of the spiritual realms. It's like, who the hell cares? Great. Take the business away. <laughs> right. God, right. Like you, I don't have the capacity in my own strength to steward, shepherd and pastor all of these different people. I, I just don't, you know, I have to control what I can control. And in doing that, I'm able to elevate those around me mm-hmm. and prop up. And now that, now that's really where you develop a servant-based leadership mindset. You now elevate those around you to do what they're called to do and do that honestly better than you, you know? And so, yeah, that I'm still figuring that out. No, I thought that was a beautiful answer. I thought you did really good with that. I was actually sitting here going, he's doing a really good job with this. I thought it was a curveball, but he got it. He hit it out of the park. Yeah. I mean, um, Jesus worked with 12. Why do we think we got to work with 200? It's it's just, and I love what you said about just steward today. Mm. And what Jesus says, worry about today. Tomorrow, Tomorrow will come with its own set of problems. All right. What about today? I love that. I think it's beautiful. It's definitely a recovery uh, laced answer. Um, I loved it. So, man, this has been great. I think we need to do this more often. Do I think it. we could, we'll do... Uh, George and Garrett bring the truth to the sobriety of the world. I don't know. We'll come up with a real cool, catchy Lord name. That's what we have Cole for. Cole, uh, you know, woo uh, on the backdrop. So there we go. Yeah, we got clapping now. We're just it, we're just nailing it. But no, this has been great, man. Garrett, I love you, dude. Thank I am excited too, for what God's doing in our relationship and just in life in general. Amen, man. Awesome. Everybody, peace out.